Two atmospheric airstreams are mixed steadily and adiabatically. The first stream enters at 32 degrees Celsius and 40% humidity at a rate of 20 cubic meters per minute, and the second stream enters at 12 degrees Celsius and 90% relative humidity at a rate of 25 cubic meters per minute. Assuming that the mixing process occurs at a pressure of one atmosphere, determine the following for the exit. The specific humidity in grams per kilogram, the relative humidity, the dry bulb temperature, and the volumetric flow rate. I will start with a diagram. So I have two airstreams that are mixing together and producing an outlet. The first stream is at 32 degrees Celsius and a relative humidity of 40% and has a volumetric flow rate of 20 cubic meters per minute. The second airstream has a temperature of 12 degrees Celsius a relative humidity of 90%, and a volumetric flow rate of 25 cubic meters per minute. I can use that information to fully define state three from which I can determine anything else that I want. And to do that, I'm going to set up a mass balance and an energy balance on my control volume. The mass balance on the control volume can consider just the dry air, just the water vapor, or the atmospheric air itself. The atmospheric air mass balance isn't generally very useful, so I will split it up. I'm saying that for the water, whatever enters has to leave because it's steady state. So m dot v1 plus m dot v2 has to equal m dot v3. Likewise for the dry air, because I have steady state operation of an open system, Nothing can accumulate, so whatever mass flow rate enters has to leave, which means m dot a1 plus m dot a2 must equal m dot a3. So unlike the previous couple of examples, it's not going to be just a matter of dividing by m dot a, but my approach is going to be the same in that I'm going to try to write this as quantities that are intensive as much as possible. So I'm going to take this equation and I'm going to recognize that for any state point, omega represents the mass of vapor per mass of dry air and the mass flow rate of vapor per mass flow rate of dry air, which means that I can write m dot v as omega times m dot a. So in my mass balance of the water vapor, I can write omega 1 times ma1 plus omega 2 times ma2 is equal to omega 3 times m dot a3. In this analysis, my goal is going to be to fully define state point 3. So I will solve for omega-3 and write m dot a1 over m dot a3 times omega-1 plus m dot a2 divided by m dot a3 times omega-2, where m dot a3 is just the sum of m dot a1 and m dot a2. So what I have is a mass-weighted average. 
I end up with something similar looking if I set up an energy balance. Because I have an open system operating steadily, whatever energy enters must leave. And if I'm treating this mixing process as being adiabatic, that means no opportunities for heat transfer. If I'm neglecting work because there's no opportunities for work and I neglect any changes in kinetic and potential energy, then what I'm going to be left with is the sum in of m dot h is equal to the sum out of m dot h. So I'll write this as m dot a1 h1 plus m dot a3 h3 is equal to m dot oh m dot a2 h2 is equal to m dot a3 h3 or h3 is m dot a1 over m dot a3 times h1 plus m dot a2 divided by m dot a3 times h2. So the enthalpy and the humidity ratio are mass weighted averages of states one and two. Once I have h3 and omega-3, I can use those two independent intensive properties to fully define state three from which I can determine any other psychrometric properties that I want, including but not limited to the humidity ratio, the relative humidity, the specific volume, which when combined with the mass flow rate will give me volumetric flow rate and the dry bulb temperature. So my approach is going to involve determining H1 and omega-1 from T1 and V1, as well as H2 and omega-2 using T2 and V2, and then looking up the specific volumes so that I can calculate a mass flow rate from the volumetric flow rates, using those mass flow rates to determine a mass flow rate at state three, using my mass flow rates to average together omega-1 and omega-2 to determine omega-3, as well as H1 and H2 to determine H3, from which I can determine V3, V3, so that I can determine volumetric flow rate from my mass, and T3. That's my approach. Since we have an atmospheric pressure of one atmosphere, and since I could probably get away with approximating the property determination with the psychrometric chart, we have the option of doing the psychrometric calculations by hand or with the chart. Why don't we try it both ways, just to compare and contrast the process. So I will position states 1 and 2 on the psychrometric chart, and then locate state 3. So at state 1, I had a temperature of 32 degrees and a relative humidity of 40%. 32 degrees is going to be this line here. 40% is going to be this line, which means that my intersection is right here. There's state point one. I'll switch to a different highlighter. How about blue? At state two with blue, I have a temperature of 12 degrees Celsius and a relative humidity of 90%. which means that my state point two is right here. Interesting thing about a mixing process like this, state three is going to lie on the line connecting states one and two. If I had equal mass flow rates of one and two, it would be right in the middle. If I had twice as, ma if I had twice as much mass flow rate at one as I do at two, it would be positioned a third of the way over. The relative positioning is based on how much mass flow rate of each there is. So using the chart lookup, at state one I have an H1 of, let's call that 63 maybe, 62 would be right here, 
64 would be right here. So 63-ish. H1 is about 63 kilojoules per kilogram of dry air. Omega-1 is going to be about 12. Let's just call it 12. Exactly. 12 grams of water per kilogram of dry air. And specific volume one is This line is 0 0.88, so maybe 85, I guess 885, maybe 8825, maybe 881, even a little bit less than that. Let's just call it 881. 0 0.881 cubic meters per kilogram of dry air. And then we repeat the process at state two. So at state two, we have an enthalpy of probably 32, maybe just a skosh more. 32 kilojoules per kilogram. Omega two is going to be about eight. I'll draw a straight line so that we can see a little bit more closely. But I wrote it so it'd be convenient. About eight, let's just call it eight, maybe 7.95 if we wanted to be real accurate, but let's not be too arbitrarily precise. Eight grams of water per kilogram of dry air. And that specific volume is 0 0.818, maybe. And this is 0 0.81, this is 0 0.82. Here would be 815, 8175. Let's call it 8. 0 0.818 cubic meters per kilogram of dry air. So comparing that to the hand calculations. At state one, I had a temperature of 32 degrees Celsius and a relative humidity of 40%. H1 would be CP of air times T1 in Celsius plus omega one times HV, and we are approximating HV with HG at T1. So CP of air is going to come from table 820. That is 1.005. So if I wake up my calculator, I got work to do calculator, 1.005 times the temperature at state one, which is 32 degrees Celsius, plus omega at state one, we don't know yet. So let's calculate omega. Omega at state one is 0 0.622 times PV1 over P minus PV1. PV1 is going to be P1 times PG1. And PG1 is PSAT at T1. So if we go into our steam tables and we find a temperature of 32 degrees Celsius, I can see that my saturation pressure is 0 0.04759. 0 0.04759. And then we are multiplying that quantity by 0 0.4. 04759 bar to get the vapor pressure. So calculator, we can optimistically delete that, start over. 
0 0.622 times 0 0.4 times 0 0.04759 divided by 1.01325 because one atmosphere would be 101.325 kilopascals, which is 1.01325 bar minus 0 0.4 times 0 0.04759 and I get a syntax error, as is tradition. My humidity ratio at state one is 0 0.01191. And remember that's kilograms of water per kilogram of dry air. So if we're doing an apples to apples comparison, that would be 11.9 grams per kilogram instead of the 12 value that we got from the chart. Now that we have the humidity ratio, we can finish our H1 calculation. 1.005 times T1 in Celsius plus omega-1 times Hg at 32 degrees Celsius. Back into my steam tables. Hg at 32 degrees Celsius is 2559.9. So, calculator, if you would please, 255. Nope, two, there you go, 559.9. H1 is 62.65. So compare 63 versus 62.65. That's the accuracy that we get when we do the calculations by hand. Lastly, I want to calculate specific volume. And that would be R times T over P. Bear in mind that the specific volume of the atmospheric air is expressed per unit mass of dry air. And because I'm modeling the behavior of my atmospheric air using Dalton's law, the volume of the atmospheric air is equal to the volume of the dry air, which means that the specific volume of the atmospheric air per unit mass of dry air is equivalent to the specific volume of the dry air, which means that I'm just calculating the specific volume of dry air by using specific gas constant of air times the temperature of the air, which is just T1, divided by the partial pressure of the air, which is P minus PV. Since I didn't calculate PV earlier, I'm going to plug in phi times PG. And in place of the specific gas constant for the air, I'm using universal gas constant divided by the molar mass of dry air. So altogether, this would be 8.314 kilojoules per kilomole Kelvin divided by 28.97 kilograms per kilomole. Those two quantities come from the inside of the front cover of the textbook. 8.314 kilojoules per kilomole Kelvin and table A1 respectively, 28.97. And then we are multiplying by T1, which is 32 plus 273.15 Kelvin. And we are dividing by P minus phi times PG. Okay, calculator. Let's see if we can't do this. Actually, let's write that out so that I don't lose track of the unit conversions. 8.314 kilojoules per kilomole Kelvin. Divided by 28.97 kilograms per kilomole. Multiplied by T1, which is 32 plus 273.15 Kelvin. Divided by 1.01325 minus 0 0.4 times 0 0.4759. 04759. Let's definitely make sure that I don't interpret that as a six. 0 0.04759, still looks like a six. Fingers crossed. And since my goal is going to be to represent the specific volume in cubic meters per kilogram. Here, let's give myself a little bit more space. I'm going to have to write one bar is 10 to the fifth newtons per square meter and a kilojoule is a thousand newtons times meters. So kilojoule cancels kilojoule, newtons cancels newtons, bar cancels bar, Kelvin cancels Kelvin, leaving me with cubic meters per kilogram. So 8.314 times 32 plus 273.15 
times a thousand divided by p no 28.97 times 1.01325 minus 0 0.4 times 0 0.04759 0 0.04759 look at that didn't interpret a single six times 10 to the fifth and we get a specific volume of 0 0.881 So, compare and contrast 0 0.881 against 0 0.881. Look at the magnificence of our extra, what, ten thousandths place? Okay, state one done. Now we are going to repeat essentially the same process for state two. Because it's the same given independent intensive psychrometric properties. My procedure for calculating state two's properties is going to be the same. So I'm just gonna start with copying and pasting the framework and see if I can't properly substitute everything. T2 is now 12 and 90. 12 degrees Celsius, 0 0.9. So H2 is going to be dp of air times T2 plus omega 2 times Hg at T2. And there's where I would forget that I need omega first, so I will calculate that. Omega 2 is equal to 0 0.622 times Pb2 divided by P minus Pb2. And in order to be efficient and or lazy, I'm plugging in phi times pg instead of pv. And then v2 is going to be r times t2 over p2. Okay, I think that's everything. So, first up, P sat at 12 degrees Celsius. Back to our steam tables. 12 degrees Celsius has a P sat of 0 0.01402. 0 0.01402. 0 0.01402. So omega two is going to be 0 0.622 times 0 0.9 times 0 0.01402 divided by 1.01325 minus 0 0.9 times 0 0.01402 and I get a humidity ratio of 0 0.00784 0 0.00784 which I can use to calculate the enthalpy at state 2 which is going to be 1.005 times 12 because I need them to be added together, they need to have the same arbitrary zero point. So the enthalpy of water is evaluated relative to a zero point at zero degrees Celsius, therefore the enthalpy of the dry air has to be evaluated relative to a zero point at zero degrees Celsius. Then 0 0.00784 times the specific enthalpy of a saturated vapor at 12 degrees Celsius. Back to the steam tables. Hg at 12 is going to be 2523.4. 25, 23.4. And we get 31.851. So 31.851. Let's compare those two numbers against what we got in the chart. And we get 32 instead of 31.85. And we get 0 0.0078 instead of 8. So these were conservative. We didn't even try to use a ruler or a scale to try to come up with better values. And these are still pretty close, all things considered. Lastly, I'm going to be plugging in 12 because that's my temperature here. And then 0 0.9 times 0 0.01402. So for my specific volume, I'm going to get 
8.314 times 12 plus 273.15 times 1,000 divided by 28.97 times 1.01325 minus 0 0.9 and 0 0.01402 times 10 to the fifth. And I get 0 0.81783. 783 cubic meters per kilogram of dry air versus 0 0.818, which is what we got when we used the chart. So again, I'll ask, is that fourth decimal place really that important? Probably not. But hey, we are being as accurate as possible in order to understand the approximations that we make when we use the chart. Maybe I'll put that down here just to make that a little bit more clean. Okay. So now we can use our specific volumes and our volumetric flow rates to calculate a mass flow rate. So for that, I'm going to use the calculated values just because those are better. But if you were working this problem, it would be completely reasonable to use the specific volume for the purposes of this example. So m dot a1 is going to be v1 divided by a specific volume, 1, because that specific volume is expressed per unit, mass of dry air, and volumetric flow rate at state 1 was 20 cubic meters per kilogram. And our specific volume, no, not cubic meters per kilogram. What was the time unit? Minute. 20 cubic meters per minute. That's better. Okay, 20 cubic meters per minute divided by our specific volume at state 1, which was 0 0.88084. 0 0.88084. Cubic meters per kilogram of dry air. Presumably I want kilograms per second later on, although it doesn't really matter here because I'm not doing anything with the result. So a minute is 60 seconds. Minutes cancel minutes, cubic meters cancels cubic meters, and I'm left with kilograms per second. So 20 divided by, let me just double check that I wrote down my specific volume correctly, 0 0.880836. Multiplied by 60, and I get 0 0.37843. 0 0.37843. Cubic meters per kilogram. Kilograms per second. Good try, John. Kilograms of dry air, specifically, per second. And I can repeat the process for m.a2 which is going to be V2 divided by the specific volume of dry air at state two, which is 25 cubic meters per minute. So confident am I in that number that I'm going to go back and check it? Yep. Divided by 0 0.81783. 0 0.81783 cubic meters per kilogram of dry air. And one minute is 60 seconds. Cubic meters cancels cubic meters, therefore I get kilograms per second. So 25 divided by 0 0.81783 times 60. And I get 0 0.50948. So m.a1 is 0 0.37843 kilograms per second, and m.a2 is 0 0.50948 kilograms of dry air per second. And then from my mass balance of the dry air, I know that m.a3 has to be the sum of those two numbers, which is going to be 0 0.88. 0 0.88791 kilograms of dry air per second. So now I have everything I need to determine H3 and omega-3 using the mass weighted averages 
that I had determined back on this page. So I'm going to take 0 0.378 divided by 0 0.888 times omega 1, which is 0 0.011909 plus 0 0.5095 divided by 0 0.888 times omega 2, which is 0 0.00784. Let me just scroll through and make sure that that looks correct. And it does look correct to me. So I get an omega-3 of 0 0.00784. 0 0.00784. That would be kilograms of dry air. No, kilograms of water per kilogram of dry air. And I repeat the process for H3. So 0. 3 and then some numbers divided by 0 0.5 and then some numbers multiplied by h1 which was 62.65 let's go 647 too many decimal places and then we are adding to that 0 0.50948 divided by 0 0.888 times h2 which was <clears throat> which was 31.851 and I get 64.8088 that's kilojoules per kilogram of dry air from these two quantities I can fix my position on the chart and determine anything else that I want or I can determine those with hand calculations so 0 0.0078 is going to be 0.0078. That can't be right. So with a value of omega-3, that is actually the correct value and not this incorrect value. That was 0 0.009574. Wonder why I wrote down the wrong one. No one will ever know. Let's see, 0 0.9574 would be about nine and a half. Go a smidgen more. And then because I know it has to be connecting the two, that's actually enough to position it, but I will point out while we're here that that's also about 45. Which is nowhere near what I got for my enthalpy. Why? Why is that nowhere near? Oh, that's why. Huh. Okay, we're dividing by m.3, which was 0 0.888. That gives us about 44.97. I could go back, I could edit out that mistake and pretend like it never happened, but I think that that's a good way to remember that even if you're not using the psychometric chart as a direct lookup, it can be a convenient way of sanity checking your calculations. I mean, if we're doing a mass weighted average, we know that we should end up somewhere between this number and this number. And the fact that I ended up with an enthalpy that was higher and also a specific volume that was the same as the specific volume as day one, those were strong indications to me that those numbers were not correct. Keep in mind, you shouldn't assume that you will make no mistakes. You should build in mechanisms that catch the mistakes when they happen. Anyway, now that I have a specific enthalpy and a humidity ratio, I can determine the rest of them. So T3 from the chart is going to be about 20.3. The specific volume from the chart is going to be about 0 0843 and the relative humidity is going to be about 62, 63%. But in the interests of calculating these quantities by hand for practice, 
Let's recognize that omega-3 is going to be 0 0.622 times PV3 over P minus PV3. So again, it's algebra time, omega-3 times P minus omega-3 times PV3. Go to 0 0.622 times PV3, so PV3 times the quantity 0 0.622 plus omega-3. And then I take omega-3 times P divided by that quantity, and I get 0 0.622 plus omega-3 in the denominator. So omega-3 times the pressure, I'm saying that the mixing process is happening isobarically. So P3 is equal to P1, which is equal to P2. Therefore, if I take 0.009574 multiplied by the pressure in bar, which is 1.01325, divided by 0 0.622 plus 0 0.009574, that will give me a vapor pressure in bar. And then H3 is equal to CP of air times T3 plus omega-3 times HG at T3. This is a little bit more complicated because I have to work my way to an answer as a result of a guess and check process. I mean, this is essentially three equations and three unknowns. I'm saying 0 0.0154 bar is equal to the saturation pressure times the relative humidity, which I don't know. And I'm saying that for a given T, I can look up HG, and I'm using H3 to determine T3 and HG at T3. So I essentially have four equations and four unknowns. It's just that two of the equations are property lookups which means I can't actually do the algebra to solve for those. So instead, I have to guess and check my way through. So the way I'm going to approach this is guessing a T3, looking up an HG, and then calculating what that would yield for an H3, and then repeating until my H3 is what I know the actual H3 is, which is 44.976. I mean, again, we know from the chart lookup, T3 is just 20 and change, 20.2 maybe. But in a situation where we didn't have the chart, this is how we would have to solve for that temperature. So the way that we would start this process is by assuming temporarily that T3 was a mass weighted average of T1 and T2. It's not because the relationship isn't just linear, but let's assume that it was in order to get a starting point. So my mass flow rate at state one, you guys know how good I am at this calculation. Actually, you know what? Since we have one that works, let's just start there and plug in T2, which is 12, and T1, which is 35, question mark. Thirty-two. So that gives me a starting temperature of 30. Nope, that's still wrong. I didn't correct this. Okay, the denominator should have been 0 0.88791. And 0 0.5 divided by 0 0.88791. Okay, so the starting temperature we're going to use is 20.524. 
20.524. And then we're going to interpolate a value for HG. So 20.524 is going to occur between 20 and 21. So 2538.1 and 2539.9. So calculator, if you would please. It's going to be 20.524 minus 20 divided by 21 minus 20 is equal to x minus 2538.1 divided by 2539.9 minus 2538.1. We get a value of 2539.04. And then using those quantities to calculate H3, I get 1.005 times 20.524 plus my omega-3, which I know, 0 0.009574 times 2539.04. And we get 44.9. So that's not exactly the same. It's probably close enough to be fine. But in the interest of demonstrating this process, let's think through what we would do next. Our H3 didn't, since our H3 isn't perfect, we are repeating the gas process. And think about whether or not we should increase or decrease T3. Bear in mind that Hg is a function of temperature, and Cp times temperature is a function of temperature. So in order to increase H3, we're going to have to increase the temperature. So let's increase by, oh, let's go with 0.1, shall we? I mean, we could be a little bit more scientific about why we're increasing the number to the quantity that we are, but just in the interest of getting somewhere to start, let's use 20.624. So I will interpolate again using 20.624 to get a new HG, which is 2539.22. And in fact, we could re rewrite this on my TI-89 so that the temperature was a thing that we plugged in at the end, and that would make that process go a little bit faster, but we are in this for the guess and check part. We might as well do the guess and check part manually. I mean, if we go that far, we might as well just open up MATLAB. So 45.0376. Oh, look, we went up a little bit too much. So let's back off a little bit, maybe 20.55. That, by the way, is where the power in starting with a mass weighted average really shows itself because we ended up real close 2539.09 2539.09 and you know we could also think through if we keep this process up a couple of times we could generate a line and then use a line of best fit that would be another way to try to be as accurate as possible. 39.09. 44.96. So, do you guys think that's close enough? I mean, probably, but hey, I got the space. Maybe 5, 6. What do you think? Is 5, 6 going to be the number? I think it's going to be the number. But let's see what happens. 5, 6, 5, 6. 2539.11, 2539.11. And ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, I just deleted the equation. Great. 1.005 times 25, excuse me, 20.56 plus the humidity ratio, which was 0 0.009574 times 2539.11, and we get 44.9722. So you guys think that's accurate enough? I mean, probably. Let's see, we increased by 0 0.01 and that increased by almost a tenth. So if we want to increase by about a third of a tenth, maybe about half of a tenth, 
We should increase by half, so 20.565. Let's go with 566. I mean, we're really getting into the weeds here, but this is the process. 2539.12. 9.12. Okay, now. 566 and 2539.12. 44.9784. Oh man, a little bit too much. 44.9784. Should have just done 20.565. Okay, whatever this is, I'm going to call it. Because you guys get the idea, right? Hey, look, it's that number that we wanted. Close enough, 44.9774. So we're calling T3 20.565. That's what we've decided. And we wanted relative humidity as well. So using T3, PG3 is going to be PSAT at T3. So we can interpolate, and I will start with this equation and replace 2538.1 with the saturation pressure at 20 degrees Celsius, which is 02339. 02339.0. Calculator, that's not a zero. What should do one? And then 0 0.02487. And that gives me a saturation pressure of 0 0.024226. 0 0.024226. Then V3 is going to be PV3, 0 0.01536, divided by PG3, which is 0 0.024226, 63.4%, 63.4%. Let's add in a degree Celsius on this. Oh, you can't see what I'm doing. And then T3 and V3, what else do we want? We have the humidity ratio. We have everything we need except for the volumetric flow rate. So that's going to require that we calculate V3, which is VA3, which is the same exact process as the last two times. So let's do that one more time just for good measure. Zero point zero one five four zero one five four. So since we actually have PV three, might as well use it. So our specific volume at state three is going to be eight point three one four times twenty point five six five plus two hundred seventy three point one five times 1,000 divided by 28.97 times 1.01325 times, excuse me, minus 0 0.0154 because we happen to have PV3 times 10 to the fifth. Unnecessary parentheses just to make me feel better. And I get 0 0.78565. 0 0.78565. Let's compare that against the chart, shall we? 0 0.5, 0 0.78565 versus 0 0.844. So 
but what's up with you specifically? You shouldn't be less than any of those numbers. Two, three, four, five, six, five, two, three, three. Ah, okay. Missing a closing parenthesis here, which means that this parenthesis at the end actually was unnecessary. Okay, 0 0.844. I think if we've taken anything away from this example problem so far, it's that despite the fact that the calculated results should be closer as a result of human error, sometimes they're not. 0 0.84484 is everything we need to calculate a volumetric flow rate. So we take our mass flow rate at state 3, which is... which is 0 0.88791, 0 0.88791. And we multiply by our new specific volume, and that's in kilograms of dry air per second, but multiplied by cubic meters per kilogram of dry air. The kilograms of dry air cancel, and we're left with cubic meters per second, and we get 0 0.75. We probably want an answer in cubic meters per minute because that's what everything else was in. One minute is 60 seconds. We multiply by 60, we get 45.003 cubic meters per minute. So we have the humidity ratio state three in kilograms per kilogram, which is what we wanted. We have a relative humidity in percentage. We have a temperature, it's a dry bulb temperature in degrees Celsius and a volumetric flow rate in cubic meters per minute. So we have everything we need to consider this question answered. I will point out, we had a volumetric flow rate at 1 and 2. Why didn't we just take volumetric flow rate at state 3 is equal to volumetric flow rate at state 1 plus the volumetric flow rate at state 2? So the reason that we don't do that is because there is no such thing as the law of conservation of volumetric flow rate. It's the law of conservation of mass flow rate. It's not that the volumetric flow rates are added together to yield approximately 45, which is essentially what we got, by the way. It's that... If the densities are pretty equivalent, then the mass flow rate that I get at the end yields a volumetric flow rate at the end that is pretty close to what it would have been with the volumetric flow rates at 1 and 2 added together. So it is a result of how the mass flow rates and specific volumes combined, and not 20 plus 25. The other thing I'll point out while we're looking at this problem is, why do we care? Why are we mixing airstreams together? How is that relevant to HVAC analysis? The reason this is relevant is because it costs a lot of money to heat and cool air. It's in our best interests to avoid heating and cooling air as much as possible. If you're operating an office building in the middle of winter, and it's 5 degrees Celsius outside, and you're trying to keep it at 21, it's a lot easier and more efficient energy-wise to mix some of the air that's already in inside with some outside air and then you don't have to heat it as much to hit your target set point. We mix together some inside air and some outside air to run through our HVAC system so that we don't have to provide as much of the energy that would be required to bring the outside air to its set point conditions every single time. The real question then becomes how many air changes per hour do you need to accommodate the ASHRAE standard that's specific for the type of environment you're analyzing? If it's a classroom or a hospital, you need a lot of intake air from outside. If it's a private residence, you need almost no outside air. I have lived in several college apartment buildings that didn't have any fresh air intake from outside. The HVAC system just processed inside air to keep it warmer or cooler.